We are entering the story of Joseph, one of the favorite characters of the Torah. Parshat Vayeshev is the story of Joseph, and it's full of hope and comfort for us in terms of lessons that we can learn from it. It's really, really mind-blowing. But I want to get into something which is called having dreams. Does anyone here think that dreams are real? You think dreams are real? What kind of dreams? Like the ones we have at night? Yeah, some of them. Some of them are not. So let's dig into that because this whole Torah portion of Vayeshev is all about dreams. That Joseph has a dream and he tells his brothers, listen, in my dream there's 11 stalks or bundles of hay and they all bow down to me, and I'm the twelfth hay, and a st- stack of hay, and all these uh, bundles of hay are bowing down to me. So he tells them this story, and it's kind of like a prophecy of what's going to happen in the future. And then he tells them another story, and he says, listen, there's these stars in the skies, and they all bow down to me. And uh, even the sun and the moon, which represents mom and dad, they bow down to me as well. And his brothers get really angry with him and they're like, what are you saying? So that's the story of Joseph having his dreams. And he was only 17 years old at the time. And he was telling his brothers all these dreams and they were getting really angry with him. Are you crazy? You think that we're going to all serve you? Is that what you think? You're going to take you're going to take the. Uh, kingship of our family is that what you believe and um, they all got very angry with him but I will tell you something before we get into the little ideas of dreams Kabbalistically I'll tell you something interesting about us me and Shira Shira's got a sister her name is Tehillah and uh, our new baby's called Tehillah right you know that right so uh, her sister's called Tehillah and every time when Shira is pregnant, even before we know about it, Shira's sister, Tila, gets a, calls her and tells her, listen, I had a dream that you had a baby. Are you having a baby? And uh, every single, this is every single time so far. It's really insane. And um, true story, so this is firsthand. And sometimes it's been cases where we didn't know and sometimes it was cases where we did and it was like what how i just found out how did you know so she always says i had that dream that you're having a bit so she's all the way in israel and we're all the way here in los angeles and she's been telling us that she has that dream isn't that cool true story first hand So there are many stories like this. We're not the first people to tell stories like this. There have been many, many people that have said stories like this. Uh, People that have said uh, that there's a story in Israel uh, that I heard of, of a lady who, um, she has a dream about her mom getting really, really sick and to a point where she's on her deathbed and she's about to pass away. And that was her dream. And everyone's around the bed and saying Shema, and she wakes up. So she calls her mom, and she's early early morning, six in the morning. She calls her mom, and her mom answers. And she's like, Mom, are you okay? And she's like, I was just about to call you. I'm really not feeling so good. And the daughter says to her, Mom, you just got to go to the hospital. Please do me a favor. Go to the hospital and see what you can do. It, It might be something bad. So she goes, and the doctor's, Uh, see that there's some kind of growth or whatever it was they operate on her and they said to her if you you should know that if you would have waited a few more hours i don't think you would have made it true story of somebody in israel given over by a big rabbi in israel rabbi zamu kohen who where i take most of his teachings from he says this story so the talmud actually says in berachot that there's three signs when you can know if dreams are real. There's a whole Talmud, which is pages about dreams. It's really interesting. 
But it says, in summary, there are three times, this is Rabbi Yochanan, he says, Brachot, Talmud Brachot, if anyone that's listening, 55b, Nun Hei Amud Bet, if you want to check it out and see if it's true. But the Talmud does say three things uh, guaranteed, or at least are good signs that your dream is real. One is if you have it in the morning, close to the time that you wake up. Probably, Kabbalistically, I don't know, maybe it's because morning is a time of chesed, a time of kindness. It's like this special energy. The morning has a very special energy in it. And at that moment in the morning cut, if you had a dream close to then, it's already a sign that it might be real. Uh, the second is if you see a close friend that tells you something uh, in that dream. And the third is if somebody, if you, f- if in that dream you have a solution to a problem. So that's another sign that it's real. If it's a real uh, mental, intellectual solution, then it's not just this random thought, but it's actually a solution to something in your mind, then it's a sign that it's a real dream. Now, there's some that say, those are the three things. One is it's in the morning, and the second is if it's your friend that's telling you something, and the third, it's a solution Potel is someone that's uh, giving you a solution to something. Then the Talmud actually says, but if you, some say that even if you have a repetition of your dream, so somebody comes to you and you say, okay, maybe it was a dream, maybe it wasn't, then you carry on your day, then the next night it happens again. So there's again a sign. Some say that that's another sign that that's a real dream as well. Interesting Talmud. And, um, Here we go. Here we have the story of Joseph. So let me just teach you some of the Ramchal, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, uh, one of the greatest Kabbalists of the 18th century. And he wrote some amazing works. One of them is the way of Hashem, the way God works. And in his book, in his third chapter, he has a whole section about dreams. And he says like this. I hope I'm not putting you to sleep right now when I talk about dreams. But he says like this. So, why do we sleep? Anyone have a good idea of why it's important that we sleep? Can we not just be awake all the time? You know, fish. Well, people say they do sleep, but, you know, they sleep like this. Uh, conservation. Conservation is to look after our body, which is what he brings it here. It helps our body kind of reset. Reset the entire body. Recharge. Yes, that's why Maimonides says it's not good to eat before you go to sleep. If you eat before you go to sleep, you're making your organs work in your sleep. And that means your organs are not having a real sleep as well. It's not only about your mind being out of a state of consciousness. It's about your whole body sleeping and resting. That's why people that are stressed, even if they are sleeping, their sleep isn't good. Because their organs are under stress. So even when you do sleep... Your body's in a state of stress, and that stresses your sleep. It it diminishes the power of your sleep. It's not only about losing your consciousness. It's about sleeping all your body, all your organs. It's really important to make sure that also when you go to sleep, you go to sleep calm and in a relaxed fashion. So that way, when you're actually sleeping, your organs are relaxed as well. Good. I'll tell you something else, though. This is amazing. Imagine if we didn't sleep. Do you know what would happen? Every day is the same day. It's all one long day. Do you know how painful that is? (laughs) Imagine. I remember when I was a kid, I cut my finger and I was bleeding a lot. Now, ever since then, weird as it is, whenever I see blood, I faint. I, I, I get blood taken from me. I see it and I like I feel dizzy and I'm like, oh no, I've got to go. So uh, it's strange. But when I was a kid, my finger got cut and I'll never forget that teacher in the school that was trying to calm me down. I was getting really nervous. She told me, you know what's going to happen? Tonight, you're going to sleep. And then tomorrow, it's just going to be a new day. 
and it really calmed me down. And actually, that's one of the reasons uh, uh, it's brought down in Judaism that sleep is so important, is because it allows us to forget the yesterday. It allows us to go through mentally a state of renewal. When I sleep, I'm renewing my past. Like, whatever was, was. Don't dwell on the past. Tomorrow's just going to be a new day, right? And that's the beauty of of sleep is that it allows us mentally to renew ourselves. So we said it allows us to rest our organs and our entire body, but it also allows us to forget the yesterday. Because if, imagine if we were living one big day, oh my goodness, that would be a lot of pain. So for us, it's very important. So look, this is what the, I'm, I'm translating. This is extremely uh, deep language here. So I'm translating as much as I can. He says, uh, there's an intelligent design that uh, he calls it Chochmah Eliona. That's called it intelligent design. There's an intelligent wisdom that allowed us to have two different time zones <coughs> in the world. One is the time zone of action, and the other is the time zone of rest, which is day and night. Hayom Huzman Hamaaseh. Day is the time for action, and night is the time for race for rest. And that's the way that the nature of the world is, that everyone should sleep in order to uh, rest themselves from their work. And as they're sleeping, they will be able to renew their strength in all parts of their body and in all parts of their health, meaning mental health as well. And then when you do that, you go back to the morning with a whole new day, a whole new renewal, both mentally and physically. And this is what he says. So we're going to talk about the physical, then he's going to go into the mental. He says like this, but whilst the person's sleeping, all of his strengths are resting. All of his feelings are silent. He doesn't feel much. He doesn't feel anything. His intelligence is diminished, meaning he's not really thinking either. The only thing that he's thinking that is working in his body is what we call dimion, which I believe is the meaning of imagination. So the only thing that's actually working is this imaginary aspect of your brain. And that's the only thing that is working in you. And normally, this is what he says, and this is based off the Talmud as well, in Brachot, most times it's picturing things that you went through that day. Whatever you pictured during the day that you were awake, whatever you were working on, whatever smells you were smelling, he says, he means the atmosphere, the atmosphere that you're in. I'm translating it literally, so it doesn't necessarily, but anything that influences your brain, right? Any chemistry that gets into your brain that day, also it's influenced by food as well, he says. All of these will influence the person's dreams when he goes to sleep. But then he goes spiritual. Okay, so that's all physical. And then he's going spiritual. He says, however, we have to know that also in a person, there are five parts to the soul. Okay, there's, I'm sure you know this. I've mentioned this before. There's nefesh, which is the lower part of the soul, which is the bodily part. Then there's ruach, neshama. Chaya and Yechida. I'm not going to go into the depth of the five souls. They are very. It's very important to learn them, the five different aspects of your soul. Um, but he says that the lowest part remains in your body, and the rest starts leaving your body. Okay, that's why the Talmud actually says that it's a sixtieth of death. Sleep is a sixtieth of death, and also it's a sixtieth of prophecy. So we're going to see about that in a second. But what he's saying here is that most of your spiritual energy actually leaves you. They actually separate from the body. And only a certain part of your body stays in, which is why when we uh, wake up in the morning, we say a special tefillah, a special blessing. We say moda'ani, and then we say, that soul that you put in me, we thank Hashem. You put you you returned into me my soul. What does that mean? Because in a way, a big part of my soul, my spiritual identity, leaves me when I sleep. This is 
Jewish tradition. This is what we believe, that us, a big part of us leaves us when we sleep and only a portion of us actually stays in the body. Also, by the way, when we go to sleep, there's a special prayer as well that we have. Very interesting uh, prayer. And we say uh, very interesting words. Maybe I have it written here somewhere. Um, we say at night, in your hands, I deposit my soul. Before we go to sleep, we actually say this. I'm going to leave my soul to you in the night. And that's what we say in the morning as well. So we actually say these words both when we go to sleep and when we wake up. And it's very interesting that what we're saying is, I recognize that a big part of my soul left me and it came back into me in the morning. <sighs> Then he says like this, very interesting. It's able to be influenced also during that moment, during that time, by different energies. You can be meeting angels. You can be meeting um, during this sleep. You can be meeting family members that have passed on. Um, you could be meeting other souls that are sleeping too. And these are also influencing your imagination. You remember we said that there's an imagination that's thinking things. Well, it's thinking things have happened in the past day, but then it's also starting to think things that it's seeing in its dream. And um, they are all getting mixed up. And for this reason, it says in the Talmud, every dream has stupid things in it. Every dream, every dream has things that are real, and things that are not real in it. Um, there's things that are exaggerated. There's things that are not exaggerated. Very interesting uh, to know this idea. So he also says, "As ye galay ozen anashim." This is a verse in Isaiah, in in uh, in Job, which says that when a person sleeps, he starts seeing and hearing people. He reveals to he he, he sees people. So the general idea is like this. The, the rule of dreams is that there's an imagination that goes in the person, both from your own experiences and from the influence of the soul when you are sleeping. And the, the soul is seeing things. Maybe that's why the Talmud says closer to the morning is a better sign that your dream is real. Because at that point, it's already cut off from its past thoughts. And now it's connecting to it's connecting to more to the soul. It's forgetting what happened, what it was thinking last night. It's like all in the past. Now it's after a good sleep, it's now connecting to the Neshama. So this is the general idea. I'm not going to go too much into it, but one thing is for sure is that uh, the Talmud actually says very interestingly that a person needs to be very careful with whom he speaks his dreams with because we have a rule, Al tiftach le satan. a person shouldn't open his mouth to Satan. And sometimes, uh, you know, we say things and we don't realize that we're calling on a bad energy to ourselves by saying that. You know, um, I'm so jealous of those people uh, that they are able to, uh, you know, eat a certain food when you realize that those people are people that are poor. You're jealous of them. Well, you're opening your mouth to Satan, meaning you're bringing that energy onto yourself. Okay, so they might be enjoying a certain aspect of life, but those people are having a very hard aspect in life. And we have a rule, Al tiftach le Satan. Don't open Satan's mouth. So um, we have to be careful what we wish for. That's the saying in English. In English, be careful with what you wish for. In Hebrew, al tiftach satan. If you say, "Oh, I wish I had this," you're also opening the mouth for Satan to say, "Oh, okay, that's what you want. Well, I'll give you all of that," and it comes with a package. So, in terms of dreams, a person needs to be very careful with whom he tells his dream to, because if somebody interprets it wrong, that can actually influence you in a wrong way which is also a, another teaching that we have in the Talmud, which is make sure that you tell your dream to a good person because if they interpret it in a wrong way, it can actually be influenced to you in a wrong way as well. I'm not going to go deeper into the idea of 
Joseph and his brothers and the dreams that they had. It's very, very fascinating. There's Talmud. There's a lot of Talmud on it. Um, but in general, dreams are real, and a person needs to be aware that we are not just a body. We are also an ashama, a soul, and uh, when when a person does have a dream, we have something called ta'anit chalom. If somebody sees a bad thing in a dream, uh, he needs to fast. Nowadays, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we don't do that. But it used to be when we would really interpret dreams properly in a much higher level. Today, we don't have prophecy. But when we did, and we would interpret dreams on a much better level, a deeper level, we would be very scared of our dreams, and some people would fast over them. That's called a tanit chalom, fasting over a dream. If you see a dead person or somebody that you don't want or something bad, um, people would fast to say, please, I want to remove that from me. So we know that uh, Joseph was most loved by his father. I'm going to go a bit into the portion, the Torah portion of Vayeshev. Really interesting. Vayeshev means, and he sat. Who sat? Jacob. Jacob sat and relaxed because he went through a hard time. He was suffering day after day. He was chased by Esav. 36 years he was away, tricked by Levan. He had the hardest life. Finally, he gets back to the land of Canaan. And it says he relaxed. Jacob relaxed. And what does Rashi tell us? Uh, Vayeshev is a dangerous word. In this world, there's no such thing as relaxing. That sounds harsh. It says in the mission in Pekei Avot, Adam la'amal yulad. Every single human being was created to work. No one in this world is created to just relax. There's no such thing as just relaxing in this world. There is relaxing for the sake of growth. Don't get me wrong. So for instance, I work hard. I need a few hours to relax so that I can grow. I can sleep right Re sleep is part of it but a person needs to know that life never end, never stops no one this is a jewish philosophy that we are created to work in this world spiritually and physically so that we can make ourselves a better person if i sat on a couch my entire life i'm not producing i'm actually falling i have a choice i'm either going up or i'm going down there's no standing in between and this is one of the lessons that we learn from Jacob. Now, on his level. But let's see the words of Rashi. Rashi says like this. It's not enough for the righteous that they get in the world to come. A, an amazing reward. But in this world, the pay is that they don't stop working. There's no tranquility. So the, the, the way to being rewarded in this world in the world to come and to being rewarded in this world too to, is by not stopping with the grind. And I'm not just talking about making money because sometimes working to make money only is not the only thing. I'm talking about bet becoming a better person, improving our character, becoming a person that's ready for marriage, a better parent. A you know, We build ourselves year by year by year until we leave this world and we don't stop. That's called the antithesis of Vayeshev, sitting. The only place we do sit is a place where we're studying or growing. So Shabbat is the word Shev. That's to sit. Yes, it's true. That's a place of real tranquility, but it's for the sake of growing. How is it for the sake of growing? Well, I'm not producing, so I'm actually really facing myself and growing within myself. That's important. Because if I was always working, and working and working and working, I never sat, I never had the Shev, I never had the Shabbat, then I, was, I would never have that time where I'm actually reflecting on myself. So Shabbat is about growing spiritually and less about growing in terms of our physical financial success. During the week, we also have Yeshiva. Yeshiva is a place where we study Torah. That's called sitting also. So there is a place where we sit, but those places that we sit are places of const constant growth and internal reflection. In fact, those places are the best 
places of growth. So you can sit and relax, but make sure it's a place that's going to make you grow. Because there's no such thing as comfort. Comfort is not good for you. Comfort is actually death. Comfort's when you don't feel. When you're asleep, you don't feel anything. Comfort is not what you want. Uh, the only time you want comfort is if it's for the sake of growth. So you could sleep, Maimonides says, between six and eight hours. More than eight hours is not good for you. Why? Because we're here in this world to create and produce. Life is too short. It's way too short. And every day makes a difference. Every day counts. So that's what happened with Jacob. Now, he has this son, and the Rashi says, immediately after he sits and he feels relaxed in, it, in Israel, next story happens. What's that? Joseph and his brothers are fighting with him, and eventually they put him in a pit, and they send him all the way to Egypt, and they sell him as a slave. So Jacob, again, is suffering for 22 years. He is uh, in loss of his son, Joseph, his closest son, that's something actually that I'm going to be speaking about right now. So he has a son. He has 12 sons, Jacob. And Joseph is the one that's closest to him. He looks the most like him. He is very learned. And it reminds Jacob of himself. It's a memory of himself. So he feels very, very close to his son, Joseph. And what does it say? Because he loved his son so much, the brothers started to hate him. Right? His brothers saw that his father loved Joseph more than anybody else. And one of the ways was that his father, Jacob, gave Joseph a special coat. You know, today we're very spoiled. We have lots of clothes of different styles and lines and, 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 and ways. And, you know, look at Nathan's jacket. It's unbelievable. We're very spoiled. We have so much types, we have so many types of clothes and they're so cheap. It used to be a luxury to wear a clothing which had different lines on it, different patterns on it, because it meant a lot more work. It was called Ketonet Pasim. He had a special coat that Jacob was given from, Jacob gave to Joseph, his son, for, and it was a special coat of Pasim. It had special lines on it, beautiful uh, f fashionable lines on it. Today, all our clothes have different colors and lines and different threads and materials that are added to it. That's a luxury item that we don't even think about. But that used to be a majorly luxurious item. A, a simple person would wear clothes that didn't have any added sewed pieces to it. It was just one piece. And that was the easiest way to have clothing. But Joseph had a special coat that Jacob gave him. And his brothers got jealous. Now the, ra the Talmud says like this. What do we learn from that? It says like this. A person, and this is such an important lesson for life. Listen to the language. I'm going to translate it. It's a Talmud in Shabbat. It says, Lo'olam al adam. A person should never change his attitude to one child over his other children. Why? And the Talmud says, because of the weight of two coins which Jacob gave to Joseph more than his other sons. Meaning, Jacob gave his children, his son Joseph, a special coat, which was a v just a small amount of value more than the other clothes that his other children had. It was a small amount of weight more than anything else that his other kids had. So it was a small, insignificant thing. But because of that, his, all his brothers got jealous and because of that, eventually they fought with him and threw him into the pit and sent him to Egypt. And eventually the Jews got to go to Egypt as well. Why? Because of Jacob's extra love that he gave to his son. Was it conscious? Is, did Jacob do an evil thing? No. It wasn't something that he consciously did, I don't believe. But it caused a huge after effect, butterfly effect. He did a tiny little thing. What did he do? He gave a special coat to his son Joseph over all the other brothers. Boom. Everyone got jealous. It caused a little riff in the family. Sold to Egypt. Eventually it went from one thing to the next. And from there came everything. You know, World War I. Do you know how it started? 
60 million people died. One, one of the theories of how, uh, how it started is the Archduke of, called Franz Ferdinand of Austria and Hungary was killed. And that caused rage and that eventually caused a war which eventually led to World War I. I promise you the people that killed uh, this man, uh, Franz Ferdinand, did not think that they're going to cause 16 million people to be killed. But that was the after effect of a small action that caused a huge after effect beyond imagination. So what do we learn from here? Simple. Small actions can have huge reactions in the future, but also something else. In terms of showing favor to someone over somebody else, that is a very, imp especially with children, but it's not only with children. It could be with somebody that's close to you. You know, you're with your spouse, but you're giving extra time to, I don't know, your coworker, as opposed to your spouse. Well, that's going to cause, that's going to arouse jealousy. It's important, even if you're doing the right thing. Joseph didn't do a bad thing. He was doing the right thing. But it's important to make sure that even if you are doing the right thing, don't arouse jealousy from the people around. And that's exactly what Jacob did with Joseph, which eventually caused all this problem. I'll give you an example with parenting. Let's say a parent sees one child that suffered a lot, went through a sickness or whatever it is, and the child suffered a lot, went through a hard time. So the nature of the parent is to give more to that child because that child went through a hard time. So they, f they give them extra gifts and extra attention and extra love. What does the other child say? Mommy, daddy, you love him much more than me. Why? It's not fair. Why does he get more? Why does he get the extra gift? That's what the child will say. Now, most parents will say, listen, well, they would kind of brush it off or say, because he went through something difficult. But actually, it's really important. Yes, it's true. You're right. Somebody who goes through a difficult situation needs more care and love. That's true. But we can't ignore that statement that that child is saying. That those words that that other child needs to be listened to. And what they're saying is, I need attention too. It's really important that one is not favored over the other because that's very dangerous. That's actually um, a, a good response would be when a child does say that, you know, because it could also be, by the way, if let's say, you know, one child looks very much like a parent that passed away. You have a bunch of children and one child looks much more like one of the parents. that. So you feel a certain tendency to like that child more. So the other child could say, hey, mom, do you like, you know, Debbie over Ruti? I'm talking about my own kid, right? Do you like one over the other? And one child could say that. The best response would be to say, do you, th you know, I have two eyes, right? I have two eyes. Do you think I like one eye over the other? I love both eyes. I mean, both eyes are part of me. Do you think I love one arm over the other arm? Both arms are part of me. And that's really the idea as well when it comes to educating as well. It's to understand that there's no one is better than the other. It's a spiritual thing. By the way, love is not something that is physical. We're coming into Hanukkah, by the way, right? What's, what's special about a candle? A candle, it says... A ner, a candle in this world, is like the soul. Why? It's not tangible. It's not something which you can touch. It gives off warmth. It spreads way beyond itself, right? This paper doesn't spread beyond itself. It's just a paper. But a candle, if I light it right now, that light expands way beyond itself, right? That's like the soul. It's not something which you could touch. It connects to the candle the candle's the body 
That's literally how the soul works. And that's why the Talmud says, Ner Hashem, the best example of a soul is, is a candle. That's why if you take a candle and you light it and you turn it sideways, which direction does it turn? Right? If you turn a candle sideways, which direction does the flame go? It goes back up. That's, that's what the soul does. It's always facing upwards. Everything else physically, if you turn it in that direction, it just goes in that direction. Spirituality, spirituality doesn't. I'll tell you something else about a candle, though. Right? Besides for the fact that by a little bit of darkness, a little bit of light can dispel a lot of darkness. That's what the soul does. Right? Your body is just taking its space within its space. You know, it's wherever it is within its corners physically you are the size of your body physically spiritually you're massive right because if you expand yourself beyond yourself if if you expand your giving energy now you've come more than just your space right when i when i think of all the hanukkah boxes that we're giving now our energy is not just locked into our own house our energy is spreading way beyond our house. That's called lighting the candles by the window and spreading uh, self, self-marketing self right here. But it's about, it's about spreading your light beyond your own home, right? That's a beautiful thing. So there's another thing special about a candle. A candle is unique in the way which is different than physicality because physical things, if you touch if you give physically to someone else then you lose if i give nathan 20 if i give nathan my phone here nathan take my phone right so you take it right now you better get your phone and pretend that you're taking mine okay so let's say i give you my phone and and you take it so nathan now took my phone now i've lost my phone i don't have my phone with me anymore true nathan's got it I don't have it anymore. Oh, right. I don't have my phone. So when, when it comes to physical things, if I give you something, I lose it. That's just how it is. To every action, there's a reaction. When I give, I lose. But in spirituality, it's not like that. It's true. If I give Nathan 20 bucks as a gift, I've lost the 20 bucks for myself to use it physically but spiritually, I've actually done something that stays with me. I've not lost anything. In fact, in fact, I've gained. And that's how it works with a candle. If you take one candle, which is lit, you can light a thousand candles in this room. And your candle will remain lit. We're talking about getting lit here right now. But your candle will remain lit. It's amazing. You never lose in the light on your candle. With, with physicality, it's not like that. In, in the physical world, if you give something, you've lost it. Does this make sense to everybody? Yeah. So it's true also when I give $20 in charity, I lose the $20 for myself, but the act of giving stays with me forever. So the spiritual aspect of my giving stays with me forever, never goes. That's the, that's the neshama. My neshama is being fed and it never goes away. That's the candle. It stays lit. Why am I saying this? Because when it comes to loving your children, it's the same way. There's no such thing as people have asked me, oh, so you have more than one kid? And I say, yes, I have five. Wow, you're pretty young for five kids. So I say to them, thank you first. And then I say, uh, you know, I've had this in the past where somebody's asked me, so I have a question for you. When you have more than one child, do you lose love for, how do you love them all? Because now you've got more. So don't you like kind of minimize your love for each one? You used to focus on one child. Now you have two. So you've now kind of diminished your love because you've got to spread it to two. And what I tell them is the parable of the candle. The parable of the candle teaches me that love is not a physical thing. I can love five kids. I can love all five kids and not diminish my love for the first one because it's not a physical thing. 
It's like the candle. I can light a thousand candles in the room. I'm not saying that I want to have a thousand kids. I do, but, you know, it's not possible. But, uh, you know, uh, Shira's listening. But, you know, you've got the cat. You can light a thousand candles and uh, you don't diminish your own. You, you keep your candle lit. And that's the, that's the idea of love. You never diminish love. Don't ever think that in spiritual terms, I'll give you another example. We think that if I help somebody, I'm going to lose. For instance, I've made a certain style. Uh, I've got a recipe. I want to keep that wisdom to myself. I can make challah in a special way. I don't want you to know my way of making challah because then it will diminish me in terms of how I make challah. And the truth is, that's wrong. Share your recipe with everybody. That will not diminish your recipe and your ability to make beautiful challah. I'm just giving an example. That does not make you stupid. That actually makes you extra... Uh, that makes your challah baking even more special because now... You're spreading the light of your recipe. Now somebody else has got that recipe. Oh, somebody else is making the recipe and, and when other people go to their home, they're going to say, oh, your challah is so nice. Where's it? That's so amazing. You make such beautiful challah. Now you're not the unique person that's making challah. It doesn't matter. Physically it matters, but spiritually it's actually better for you. It's like influencers, right? In terms of our language today, 2020. The best way to become an influencer is to have more influencers get to know you, right? Because the more influencers get to know you and put come on your show, let's say, then all their followers will come onto your will become followers of you. And the more popular people you have speaking to you, the more people will come to your influence, and then you'll become an influencer as well. Do you hear how this works? You'd never diminish spiritually by giving. You might diminish yourself physically by giving, but not spiritually. So that is a lesson as well in terms of, number one, the power of influence you can have by the small actions that you do, like we see by Jacob, his small action of giving extra love to Joseph, even though it was well-deserved, um, his small at that small energy that he gave caused a tremendous ripple effect afterwards so that's the second thing now i want to also um go on to the continue the story because this is amazing so joseph has these dreams we'll finish off in a few minutes joseph has these dreams and uh, his brothers hate him and they decide that he actually needs to be put to death that's what they say his brother, Joseph, needs to be put to death. Now, they come up with this idea, and obviously this is much deeper than we are speaking now, that he's trying to take away our kingship, our kingship, and he's also um, giving us, he's giving false witness against us. And therefore, whatever he's trying to claim about against us, he deserves. And he's trying to claim that we are, doing wrong things. He, he said that they're eating uh, Eva Minachai, which is a, uh, anim a, a live animal whilst it's alive. That's a transgression of the seven laws of Noah. He said that they are um, transgressing in immoral relationships, going with people that are already in a relationship and they're doing immoral things. And he also claimed that, um, uh, what else did he say? He said uh he says that they're call, calling their other brothers uh, sons of maidservants because some of the family were sons of maidservants. So these ga this Joseph was saying things to his father about his brothers. So he was kind of being a snitch is what we call it in English. What's that called in America? Uh, an informer. Does that make sense? He was being an informer about his brothers and his brothers were getting angry and they said, you know what? He deserves death because he wants, he's making claims against us that are claims that we deserve death and really he deserves death and they decided to kill him. So instead of killing him, it says that uh, they were also jealous because he said those dreams that you're all going to serve me and at the end those dreams came true, right? Because Joseph went to 
Egypt. And eventually he became the superpower of Egypt. He became the second man in command. By the way, it's, it's the most amazing story, the story of Joseph. It's really the most beautiful story that you can imagine. So after his brothers, just a summary, uh, Jacob loves his son Joseph. Joseph's brothers hate him. Joseph has these dreams, we said, and Joseph's brothers throw him in a pit. They really wanted to kill him, but then they decided last minute, let's just throw him in a pit. It says that the pit had no water in it. Why? The, ta- the Talmud says, yeah, it didn't have water in it, but it had snakes and scorpions in it. So they threw him in this pit with snakes and scorpions. And eventually they said, okay, let's just pull him out of there and sell him. And they sold him to these merchants, these Arab merchants that normally sell oil. And uh, this time they actually were carrying Uh, Not oil, they were carrying spices, beautiful smelling spices. And they decided to sell Joseph to these people. And Joseph ends up going all the way to Egypt. And he starts, he starts, he's very good looking. Joseph's a really good looking guy. And he gets hired by um, the chief executioner. But if you look at the commentary here, it says that he was actually the chief executioner of Egypt. You know that? Executing? Still normal in big parts of the world. So, uh, by the way, capital punishment, it's another whole discussion. Judaism is not completely against capital punishment, but it's very hard to enforce. So it actually exists, but it was very hard to enforce. And the reason for that is, is to enhance the severity of the sin. The whole point of death penalty in Judaism is to make us realize the severity of wrong. When a person does evil, they should know how wrong they've done. And one of the ways to know is to know that they could be convicted of a death penalty. It's very hard to enforce. It was never something that really happened. But just that concept is a very important concept. But anyway, Joseph gets hired by the chief executioner of Egypt. And he decides, uh, to. He, he's, he's hired by him, he's enslaved by him. A bit like that movie, what's it called in the Roman times, uh, uh, the Gladiator. So he, you know, you don't have a choice. He gets sold and he gets taken there, and he gets. They should make a, you know, a real movie, not based off fiction added into the story of the Torah, but based off the rabbinical uh, explanations. Nathan, you should be listening to this, but they should be using the rabbinical explanations of the stories that actually happened in the Bible, and. And then there's like a whole dimension of things that happen that, that are not discussed. And it's like a mind-blowing story. It's really amazing. So um, so Joseph gets taken and he works for this guy. And this guy is a very, you know, to be an executioner in, in those times was a very important job. Like you're, you're like the second in command. You're like Pharaoh. To be a chief executioner, you're like Pharaoh. It's a very special job. And um, he was very much a respected man. And Joseph stops working for him in his home. And what happens is, because Joseph's so good looking, uh, the wife of this executioner is really interested in Joseph. And she keeps chasing him. And she chases him and chases him. And he's a young boy. He's good looking. And he's in the middle of nowhere. And she wants to be with him. And she waits. The Talmud says she would change her clothes. This is, see, this is where you can't just rely on the biblical story. You need the rabbinical story to enhance the story even more. So the rabbis say that actually, because based on the words of the Torah, she actually would change her clothes three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, just to look attractive to him. And she'd constantly try and seduce this gorgeous looking guy, Joseph, to be with him. And she'd you know, try and attract him in all different ways. And she'd wait. There was one day where everyone had to leave the area. And um, on that day, she decides to tell everyone, I'm sick, I'm staying home. And uh, she stays home. And whilst she's home, she decides, okay, I'm going for it. And she jumps on Joseph. And Joseph starts taking off his clothes because, you know, it's hard. It's a temptation. She was a beautiful woman. It was a tremendous temptation. And Joseph basically almost 
falls to the temptation. And at some point he says, I, I got to go, right? You can imagine that. I, I just got to go. And he feels, and he says actually these words. He says, he says to her, how can I do this? He's, the, the Talmud says he saw, actually he sees an image of his father who's a very holy spiritual man. And he says, I can't be law- unlawful like this. I, you know, my, my master, he says, the, the executioner has been very kind to me. He says, how can I do this to him? I can't be unlawful. Uh, let me see the language. One second. It, she was, yeah, and then she, he was in his house. He, right, this, this man, this executioner also got very wealthy. And uh, Joseph refused. It says in the w- language, it says he refused in a long way. So it means that he really put, it was hard for him to let go. And she says, he says to her, my master doesn't know me. This is unfair to my master, meaning your husband. Uh, he gave me everything. Everything I have is from him. I don't grow in this house. And he never gave me, he never held back from me anything. Besides for you, because you're his wife. How can I do this terrible evil? And then he finally says, and how can I sin to God? And on this, our rabbis say that he started seeing an image of his father, who was a very holy man. And at that point, he runs off. And he runs off, but he leaves the jacket. He leaves his clothes in the hands of this woman. And she uses that against Joseph. When everyone comes back, she says, you don't know what happened. Joseph tried to jump on top of me. He tried to force me. And she made up a whole false story about Joseph. Now, Joseph knew that that could have happened, but he didn't care. Because he he didn't care because he knew what the right thing was. And the right thing was to overcome that temptation. One of, by the way, that's why the Talmud says that Joseph is called a tzaddik. Joseph Yosef had tzaddik, tzaddik yesod olam, a righteous person. Not everybody gets the title of a righteous person, but Joseph did because he was able to overcome his sexual temptations. And it's one of the hardest things for a man to overcome. And he was able to overcome it in the right place, in the right time. And uh, that deserves the title of a righteous one of a very righteous person. The Talmud actually says that someone who's able to overcome that, which is the Yesod, the place of Brit, the place where a person can have a child, is a, a place which can build a future. And it can also be very destructive. It's a very powerful creative force, but also a very destructive force. And if somebody is able to overcome that temptation in times when it's necessary, they are able to bring into themselves malchut, which is kingship, leadership. A person can have a tremendous amount of leadership and influence if they are able to overcome their temptation, their sexual temptations when necessary. And uh, that's a very powerful thing that Joseph did. He managed to run away and um, he was eventually p- put in prison for many years just because they believed her and they didn't believe Joseph. And actually, it says that the executioner believed Joseph. He knew that Joseph was right. He saw, he saw all along what his wife was doing. But he couldn't lie. He, couldn't, he had to admit that his wife was right. And because of that, he threw Joseph into the prison. Not like a prison of today, where you know how, when you're going to come out. It's more of an Alcatraz. Where if you go into that prison, you ain't knowing if you're going to come out of there. And Joseph did it because he knew he was doing the right thing. And eventually, he became the second person in command. But that's where the Torah portion ends. I want to just talk about one or two last thing. One thing. It says that he saw the picture of his father. And that's what made him, allowed him to overcome that temptation. Our rabbis teach us that when a person's facing temptations in the wrong way, one of the things you could do is think of your family. Think of your father. It's one of the things. 
Another thing is that you could think of a very holy person, a rabbi, a holy rabbi, someone really, you know, a real picture of a of a rabbi. That's something else that you could do because it says, Your eyes should always see people that are special. So think of someone that's very, very special and that would o- help you overcome that temptation. Now, uh, the story is told of a very big rabbi of our generation, Rabbi Badia Yosef, where a father and son came in and they said to him, Rabbi, me and my son, we just don't get along and we don't know what to do about it. We just can't get along, fighting all the time. The father came in, obviously, with his son, and he said, listen, my son. So Rabbi Vadia Yosef, a big, big chief rabbi of Israel, passed away about seven years ago. He sat with him, and he says, listen, you know, your parent is a partner with God. It's like God. That's what a parent is. It says in the Talmud, three partners in creating a child, a father, a mother, and God. Your parents are like God. They created you. You have to respect him. He says, I know, but you know, at certain times I get frustrated. I can't communicate well. My father doesn't understand me. Different generations. We just don't get along. So Rabbi Vadi Yosef says, listen, if I was in the room when you were fighting with your dad, would you be embarrassed? He says, of course. Of course I would be embarrassed. He says, okay, fine. Let's take a picture together. Me and you. We'll take a picture. We're talking about the chief rabbi of Israel, very holy man. Let's take a picture together and uh, have it printed and put it in the room, in the main room of your house, so that every time before you fight, you'll just have that picture next to you. So the son agrees. He agrees. Obviously a good kid because he wants it to work. And the rabbi says, no problem. He takes out his jacket. He stands next to uh, this son and he calls in one of his students. He says, please come, take, a, take your phone, take a picture of us too, email it to him, take his email, email it to him, send him the picture and have, him, have it printed. His father printed it, the son printed it and they hanged it on the wall. And his father says, from then on, this is a true story, the, the father says, from then on, we never had another argument again. It's an amazing idea. So one of the ways to overcome temptations is to think of great people that they themselves have have overcome temptations that will help you overcome your temptation as well. When it says that the Joseph was thrown into that pit that had no water, and the rabbis say it had no water, but it had snakes and scorpions. The sons were trying to see. They said, listen, We are not going to kill him because maybe if we kill him, then we're doing something wrong because humanity can go against God's will, right? We have free will and we can choose to kill somebody before his time. But if we throw him into a pit of animals, this is what Kabbalistic rabbis teach us or Chaim and Zohar, everyone explains. But if we would throw him into a place of dangerous animals, then he's under the force of God himself because the animals can kill him. And that's not under human's free will, right? A human has free will to kill or not kill. True? But an animal has no free will. An animal just does it. So if an animal kills someone, that's under completely God's hand. And we can know for sure that's God's decision. But if a human kills someone, we don't for sure know if it's God's decision. Maybe it's that person with his free will choosing to kill this person before his time. You hear what's going on? It's a very strange thing. This is a whole discussion in itself of free will, how free will works. If when somebody dies, is it because God wants him to die? Is that his decision? The answer is yes. So then how is there free will? How can anyone be a murderer? If somebody murders someone, so then they're going against, it was God's decision already. That's what God wanted. So where is the free will? The truth is, in general, A human being can go beyond God's decision, just like we can do things which God doesn't want. We can also kill and stop someone's life before his time. It's very interesting. A very righteous person that never did anything wrong can never be taken before his time. That's for sure. Um, But somebody who did things which are wrong and they did t- they not fully done teshuvah yet, then there's an ability for someone's free will to come and destroy and kill that person before his time. 
They threw him in a pit of s- snakes and scorpions. And the rabbis say, very powerful lesson. Yeah, it had snakes and scorpions and it didn't have water. The Torah says, the Torah says it was thrown into a pit which had no water. Our rabbis explain it had no water, but it had snakes and scorpions. This is a message to life. It's not just a story. In every person's pit, in your life, in your brain, it's like a pit. If you don't fill it with water, you're filling it with snakes and scorpions. What's water? Torah. It says, anyone who's thirsty, go and drink water. That's what it says in Isaiah. If you're thirsty, go and drink water. What does it mean, go and drink water if you're thirsty? It means drink Torah. Torah is compared to water. En ma'im el Torah. Our rabbis teach us that the biggest, the greatest analogy of Torah is water. Water and Torah is the same thing. That's the analogy. Why? Because Torah goes from the highest of places to the lowest of places. Water goes from the highest to the lowest. It can go even to the lowest of places. It makes us humble. That's what the water does. It takes us all the way down to the bottom. It also can, it can change somebody no matter how far low he is, no matter how bad he is. Water is something that cleans. So is Torah. If somebody feels tired, what do you do? You wash your face up, right? You feel weak. You feel tired, unrefreshed. You wash your face with water. The same thing is with Torah. If you feel depressed, unfulfilled, guaranteed that you need to learn some Torah. The fact that you're here learning Torah is something that's going to refresh you just like water. Water is also something that you cannot carry. You know, if if you get a strong person, Nathan's strong here, right? If you put on Nathan buckets of water, hey, how much, how many kilos of water can he carry? 25, 50 kilos of water, maybe, but not for long. Eventually, he's going to say, dude, this is heavy. I can't carry it longer. But you know what you could do? You could swim in water and you can have tons of water above you. If you dive into it, it's a whole new ball game. And that's how it is with Torah as well. A lot of times people are scared to take on some of the mitzvot of Judaism, some of the values that Judaism teaches. And uh, the idea is I'm scared not because I don't want to grow. You know, growth in every aspect of life, in personal development, is something that takes time. It's work slowly. But in some areas, you've got to dive in as opposed to always being in a place of battle. For instance, I want to be in a surrounding of good people. You know, there's Aish lit people and then there's all these people that I shouldn't be around with that are smoking up and they're doing whatever it is. Actually, I don't know what Aish lit people do. But I want to be in a, in a place with good people versus being in a place with bad people. The worst thing to do is be half-half. Half surrounded by good, half surrounded by bad. Half surrounded by good, half surrounded Then I'm in and out of both worlds. To be in and out of both worlds is very challenging. You know why? Because you're constantly facing that uh, opposition. People are pulling you in both ways. Don't do that. That's like carrying the water. Judaism says, dive into the water. Swim in it. You can have somebody who's got 50 tons of water above him. He's 20 meters below the, in the ocean, down below the water. 50 tons of water. And he's swimming happily. Easy, smooth, gliding. Because once you're in it, in an environment that allows you to be in it properly, then it's so much easier of an environment to be in. So that's also a very powerful message that we learn from water. Another idea is that water and oil, oil represents our evil, because in some ways oil also represents good sometimes. But oil can represent evil because it makes things dirty, right? And when you mix water and oil together, what goes on top? What happens when you mix oil and water together? Oil goes on top. Right, oil goes to top. Oil goes on top. The sur- the water is the Torah. If you want to get rid of your dirt, get rid of your bad, the mistakes that you've done, the things you've done wrong in your life, just add water into you. Every day add another drip of water 
and eventually all the oils will remove, be removed from the cup. Right? If you have a bit of oil on the top, the way to remove the oil is to add drip by drip water. The water will then go to the bottom. The level of water will go up and eventually the oils will overspill and come out. And you'll just have a clean glass of pure drinking water just for you. So uh, that's another message of life as well. When the pit in my brain, when my life is empty, it's not filled with water, when I'm not learning, I'm not growing, it's filled with snakes and scorpions. All the movies come in, right? If I'm in marriage, it's other people coming into my mind. It's in life, if I'm not filling myself with growth, I'm filling myself with stupidity. And it's one or the other. My brain can only hold one. It can't hold both. And don't contaminate that brain. That's, that's the pit. If the pit is without water, it's also got snakes and it's got scorpions in it. And it's got ideas that are just going to hurt you more and more and more. So the way is to not occupy the mind with the ideas of more stuff and more money and more um, chasing and fame. And all these things are like snakes and scorpions to the body. Because it makes me feel like, oh, I'm not good enough. I need to be more. I need to spend more time. To Get rid of that. Just throw it out and start filling yourself, your pit, with water. That's Torah. With Torah, with study. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're traveling, listen to a podcast. I'll give you a great podcast. It's called Relatable Judaism. It's our podcast, my podcast. It's on Spotify and on everything else. All these classes go on there. But it's a great podcast. So uh, anyway, so that's my uh, blessing for you all. We spoke about a lot tonight. We spoke about dreams and then we spoke about um, giving the right attention to your children in terms of not showing favor to one over the other. By the way, it's not only about children. It's also about friends. You know, we have a rule in our family. No whispering. Because whispering means I have something to tell you that I don't want somebody else to hear. And that means I favor you. And that causes this sense of um, anxiety, maybe not anxiety, but there's a sense of jealousy, a sense of, uh, uh, in Hebrew, it's sakranut. It's this want to understand what's going on, like this desire to want to know, what, what, what are they talking about? So uh, I'll, I'll, I don't want my friends to feel that I'm favoring one person over the other also or my co-workers, that I favor one co-worker over the other. A successful person knows how to show attention to everybody in the right places, not just to those that are really attractive to me, but to everybody that's necessary for me to be in connection with. If they're bad, then I run away from them. But I'm talking about good people. And um, we also spoke about uh, dreams. We spoke about the idea of water and the snakes. And we spoke a bit about the story of Joseph. It's an amazing story, amazing story. Remember what I told you, though? When he was traveling to Egypt, they put him in a cart which had spices. And normally, those merchants, Arab merchants, would sell. What did they normally sell? They normally sold oil. That was what they normally sold. And this time it was different. They sold spices. Our rabbis say from here, even if somebody's meant to have suffering in this world, it's, we don't call it suffering. We call it tikkun. It's your purpose. Your purpose, Joseph's purpose was to go to Egypt. Even though that was his purpose, he had to go down there in style. That was part. God never gives you a challenge which is beyond your challenge. And that's something that no Joseph noticed. Suddenly, today, they took me and they took me with a different thing. They didn't take me with oils today. Suddenly, just this time, I got sold my bad brothers. I got thrown in the pit. I got treated like dirt. But today, out of all days, the people that carried me, carried me in style. And that was a sense of, of hope for Joseph. He said, wow, God's with me. Even, and that's a message also for us in life. When, when bad things happen to us, meaning what seem to be bad, there are chances for growth. But when they seem to be bad for me, there's always moments of good in there as well. 
because whatever I need to have is for my tikkun. In Hebrew, it's called tikkun. It's my purpose. My purpose is that I need to go through this challenge, this challenge, and this challenge to become Jack Melo. To become me, successful me at the end of my life, I needed to have to go through those challenges. That was my tikkun. And if it's my tikkun, I will get it. But there's some, even in those challenges, there are places where if it's not my tikkun, I don't need to get it. And I'll get a beautiful carriage filled with smelling spices, or a, a truck of spices, and I'll be able to go in style. And that's also a very powerful message. That yes, he got thrown in the pit, got taken, sold, terrible feeling, sold by my brothers and taken all the way to Egypt. But he smelt the spices. And today they were taking spices. They weren't taking oil. And that was a sense of satisfaction and hope for Joseph as well. So there's so much to learn of this story. Um, but hopefully there were some messages that you got out of it that were impactful and meaningful for you. 